Oh, wait. Are we live? Are we recording? I think we are. We most definitely are. Okay, so if you're watching this from YouTube uh, later, then don't worry, there are hopefully yeah, be timestamps for you to go to the reaction and skip all the introduction. But I'm do going to wait about 10, 15 minutes for people to join the live stream. I do think that a lot of people like watching, maybe not live streams, but uh, longer videos because, you know, it, it, it's a great way to sleep. You know, when I go to sleep, uh, a lot of times I just put a lot of longer videos and I think that's pretty awesome. We got one viewer. That's pretty nice. Gosh, I I need to I need to say this because I'm so excited. And the reason I am so excited is because I just watched Spider-Man. That's right. Uh Spider-Man. It was uh what's the name of the movie? Spider-Man uh shit, Far From Home, right? I think that's the name. Spider-Man Far From Home. And gosh, it was such an amazing movie. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who's watching live. I'm not even that big of a fan of the MCU Marvel movies or like Spider-Man in general. But I I, I, I do like, I enjoyed the movie a lot. I don't know if you guys have watched it yet. Uh, I had the first available ticket, uh, which in Mexico here right now today, December the 15th, Spider-Man was live. Or it was like, it was the premiere, the release of the movie. And I got to watch the first, uh, in the morning, about 11 a.m., I watched the first screening of the movie, at least as far as I know. Because I didn't want any spoilers. I didn't want anything like that. And let me tell you, it was a blast. Like, again, again, like I said, I'm not going to spoil anything, but whew, oh boy, it was quite the movie. We also, we already have one like. That's pretty nice. Thank you, uh, whoever's uh, given a like to my video. Uh, you guys remember that you can uh, put in the chat whatever comments you feel like putting. You know, some Perrier water. Today we're going to do a reaction about Quebec. It's really nice. Um, uh, you, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. Hello, hello, Flint. Flint, you know, I think in that movie Spider-Man, there's a character named like that. No more spoilers, no more spoilers. So yeah, Quebec. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of modern discourse about Quebec uh, other than the whole independence nationalist movement. Is it like a nationalist movement? Could you call it that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. We don't hear, I don't hear a lot about Quebec nowadays or ever. So I think it's pretty nice to watch this video. It's over 50 minutes. Some of the people that recommended said it was like crowd, like crowd styled. And I do, if you know me, I you know that I enjoy a lot the crowd videos on Quebec. So, oh, we went back to zero viewers. I don't want to start too soon because, you know, Tell me if you guys like this new... I know a lot of, I try a lot about... I know I try a lot of new stuff. Uh, but the circle camera, I think it, it's cool. It's like a cool filter. It's a cool design. I'm going to stick with it at least for a few weeks and see what's up. Uh, but I really enjoy it. Okay, so we are jumping between... Between zero and two viewers. So that's pretty nice. I'm going to test the audio. I'm just testing the audio. Oh, it's very low. A nation is a hard thing to define. Nations are understood to be communities that are separate from each other based on some cultural peculiarity. 
Okay, so yeah, audio tested. It's pretty good. We're back at it. We're, we're back at zero, man. You know what? Fuck it. Let's just go for it. So we're going to start. Boom. Quebec. What is a nation? I have no career. A nation is a hard thing to define. Nations Whoa. are understood to be communities that are separate from each other based on some cultural peculiarity. On the surface, it might be easy to think of these differences once they exist, but formalizing them is difficult. It is then that people select a set of important facts to begin their process of othering. It can be language, religion, shared ancestry or common values, but there's great liberty in that choice. Once a narrative is widely accepted, however, oh, any one Germany. government that can argue a claim for it has legitimacy for its existence and interests. Uh -huh. This is what is Austria, meant by a France nation state. Wrecked. A state ruled by a nation for its self-determination in the world stage, at least on paper. Since the mid-19th century, this arrangement has proved to be the globe's favorite. As an <laughs> idea, it spread like wildfire after its formulation, but for our purposes, one of the places where that argument was uniquely difficult and important to make was in the American continent. When American independence movements sought hey, to gain self-management from Colombia, outside Colombia, we did it. They had to deal with a particularly unique challenge to justify their new states. To rule vast, ethnically diverse masses, yeah. the political classes of the new world tested many stories and built new American identities. What that meant, however, was very up for debate. The various approaches to colonialism in the new world created very different societies with distinctive worldviews, challenges, and structures. Generally, however, there are two large spheres split along a clear language barrier today. English Britain's two Spanish. former North American colonial possessions and the US rest and of Canada, them. and a very ambiguous everywhere else. One of the ambiguities of this latter region being that it has no clear name or boundaries. South America, as in what's south of the US, is a misused term. These are the correct divisions of the American landmasses. Spanish America excludes Brazil and some of the Caribbean, Iberian America includes Brazil, and then we get the more encompassing term Latin America. Ooh. However, Latin America is not a perfect catch-all either. The thing it is trying to allude to are those places in the Americas which speak a language that's derivative of Latin. So we draw out Suriname, a bunch of Caribbean islands, Guyana, and Belize. Still, if we try to understand the term as those places in the Americas, among a yeah, it's extremely complicated. Like the term Latin America, I think it's the most commonly used. Like if you want to talk about the Americas, excluding the U.S. and Canada, uh, it, it's just like the best term to use. But it's not very. Yeah, you exclude all the Dutch speaking parts because Dutch is not a Latin language. Same with uh, English and all the English colonies, uh, like Belize, for example. Mexico borders Belize. Uh, so it's just weird and complicated. Labels, as I've always said, or I, I at least I've said uh, a while, labels are very complicated. And let's go. Howdy, man. This is your video. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, really? You've been watching the whole time. I don't know why it shows zero either, but either way, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, think about this. Think about this, okay? The Americas were the first attempt at countries and nation states outside Europe. Uh, or uh, like the first time a colony became independent. That's what I'm trying to say. The first time a colony became independent, it happened in the Americas. The US, Haiti, Latin America. Uh, so Region it came with a lot of problems. Of Latin. We and get I'm excited to comprehensive. talk about Quebec. But I really am. There is a big exception to this rule. When we include French America, there exists a black sheep, a yeah. place that muddies the waters at least when confronting what the implication means. Quebec. Oh yeah, true. Asking if the Quebecois are Latin Americans can get someone a mixed bag of responses. Yeah, no. Quebec is after all physically separate from this bigger region and its shared history. Adding to that, the people most focused with the creation of a meaningful Latin identity tend not to mind it too much. From the perspectives of groups like Alba and Selac, Latin America is to be understood in contrast and even opposition to the US. 
they understand their political activity as a stance against its influence. So, when asked to consider if a faraway province of a federation ruled by the British monarch should be included in this community, there are reservations. I mean, I'd be it happy to. It goes both to. ways. Some Quebecois themselves might not accept the label. Yeah. Still, the making of this video was motivated by a desire to explore this wrangle. What is Quebec? How did it come to be? To answer that, we will explore the history of a place and a people largely forgotten in the America's history. The story of empires, interests, and an ethnic tug of war in the rogue he wrote to Canada, one which his blunders still echo into the present. Yeah. However, we will open the story of stories, of narratives and self-conceptions, before Quebec. Human history in this place begins with the first peoples who laid the ground, for all the others who would come. How do they call it in Canada? Nations? A tribal nation? Something like that, right? Nidang Le Li Prologue I Ice and Fire Ooh Among the native populations of the Americas there are many origin stories. Oh the Aztecs. But one that is very anthropologically interesting is that of the Salish. They tell a tale that is very reminiscent of the crossing of the Bering Strait, where a great bridge of ice is created for their ancestors to move away from their enemies, only to disappear once they've crossed. As it travels through space, the Earth shifts its position in relation to the Sun. The this exposes straight. it to varying amounts of solar radiation that then change the planet's average temperature, and since these movements are rhythmic, the process loops. This observed pattern is called the Milankovitch cycle, and it was during one of its cold stages the last glacial period known as the Ice Age, that humans First are thought nation. to have arrived on the American continent. Hello, howdy friend, Although how are you doing? migration to the Americas, especially when it happened exactly, is a matter of debate. A crossing from modern-day Chukotka to Alaska through a land bridge is widely accepted it's among hard to tell. series. The first people to arrive here were inadvertent nomads chasing their game, who found in this region of North America a landscape covered in deep layers of ice and snow. As the Milankovitch cycle reached its warm period, the Earth's temperature rose, clearing the ice and creating a vast landscape for these first peoples to explore. Nevertheless, with global warming came the melting of polar glaciers, which rose sea levels to the point where the land bridge they first crossed was swallowed by the sea. Yeah. Ever since it happened, Asia and North America have been disconnected by land. Now trapped in this closed-off continent, well, these fuck. newcomers <laughs> settled in. As they continued their pattern of moving and hunting over thousands of years, there eventually were human inhabitants in every corner of the Americas. Analysis of mitochondrial DNA seems to suggest the migration came along the Pacific coastline, then inland, and finally north towards what today is eastern Canada. Oh. Near the tropics, favorable conditions for large-scale agriculture allowed for empires and centralized civilizations. Yeah. The Far North and the skills needed to succeed in We saw this on the Mexican were very video. Different. Canada today is almost 10 million square kilometers in size. Second? Yet, all arable land in it is far flung, and its sum is slightly smaller than Spain, which is less than 5% of the country's total territory. Wow. Large-scale farming as that of the Incas made little sense. A spread out people without livestock amidst winters as cold as minus 40 degrees Celsius Jesus. had no incentive to stay put, so they spent their time perfecting the survival tactics of their ancestors. The early First Nations became an organized and effective group First of Nations, hunter gatherers, yeah. experts in the land who maximized the use value and renewability of everything they could dispose of. One of the most extreme cases of how good at survival these nations were are the Inuits. The Inuits came to America during the last pre-Columbine migrations. Their tribes weathered themselves to survival in the Arctic. In an ecosystem full of man-eating predators and inhospitable weather, they developed a way of life that made human sustenance possible with considerable achievements. Perhaps to the amazement of many, a study made in 1955 observed that Alaskan inland Eskimos had a daily caloric intake of 2,700 calories which would be more than 500 above that that the average North Korean has Holy. had since 1961. 
Oh my Further God. south, competing tribes would go to battle with each other over the best ground. They formed rigid codes for warriors to behave in combat and captivity. They had a wide diversity of languages, strict, varying social structures and cultures, from dances to rites of passage to ceremonial torture, hmm. as well as deep and complex spiritual beliefs, tying people to the land of their ancestors. At some point, there was a boom of horticulture in places with friendlier yeah. conditions. With it, populations grew, and women, largely responsible for crops while men engaged in hunting or war, took an important political role as leaders and administrators, sometimes feeding more people with harvests than men could feed with meat. For the rest, though, things remained more or less the same. Soy boys. While a few tribes in the luscious lands encamped themselves, most remained semi-nomadic. Regardless of either condition, protecting their space was paramount. There would be constant raids between the tribes, and that led to a culture of honor, Endless conflicts of domination and retribution that resulted in generational land. I guess the, the landscape is very similar to what you would find in Siberia. I think the U.S. would be more like Central Asia, like the Central Asian Plateau. But Northern Canada, as it's a lot colder, it would be like si Siberia. These were sometimes resolved, and whenever that happened, ever larger territories became integrated into single polities that then repeated the cycle with their new neighbors from whom they took prisoners for tribal assimilation, if not slavery. The selection pressures of life in the North American taigas and tundras also motivated technological advancement. Many variants of the kayak were developed to navigate the river networks of this land. Deep nets and weirs were used for fishing. Specific types of footwear and dock sleds were designed to travel across the heavy winters, along with weaponry and techniques for sustainable hunting, refrigeration, tanning and construction. From the wigwams of the Algonquins to the underground homes of the Salish to the houses of the Haudenosaunee. Now, this is an overview of thousands of years. Lots of specifics we could know about these Earth peoples are missing from the record. These cultures had no writing. Their oh. stories were carried orally through lore keepers and elders, who succumbed to disease by the thousands after first contact with the Europeans. Still, surviving stories in archaeology can That's help a shame. us clarify the really is. past. Even if because in a it would have been sense, fascinating. many things will remain a mystery. The important thing to understand is that there existed people here before francophones, anglophones, and alphones were even relevant political concepts. These nations lived in an intricate and far-reaching web of political alliances, with trade networks so extensive they reached into the cities of Mesoamerica. Oh. The conditions they created over millennia. Mexico and Canada had a trade agreement before NAFTA was ever, before Mexico and Canada were even a thing. Would set the stage That's for interesting. The foreigners would start coming from That's these. wholesome. I like that. Build a town. Part one. Je me veux souvenir. Is that how you pronounce that? I don't know. All ages have their luxury items, which are signifiers of status that are meant to display the acquisitive power, social relevance, and security of the top individuals in society. Even in the Soviet Union, a society founded on the idea of erasing class differences between its members, it was possible to identify the sons of top officials and ministers by the fact that they wore jeans. Jeans were almost exclusively available in Western markets, and the options one had to get some were knockoffs of inferior quality from Eastern Europe, an ill-fitted pair from the black market, or being a member of the well-traveled elite. Throughout history, many wars and battles have been fought for commodities or more advantageous positions oh. in the trade routes that guarantee access to them. Oh, this, this is important to say in the context crisis. of Quebec's That's an history interesting event. because of the blue jeans of the 17th century that allowed its predecessor, the colony of New France, to develop and expand. While the First Nations continued their long-standing dynamics, Europe had made it to the 1500s, and by that time, many European kingdoms had overhunted their forests. Some creatures, like elks and bears, so common in the Grimm Brothers folktales, are near non-existent in Germany today. 
Additionally, in many countries, especially the colder regions of Northern Europe, there was a real necessity for cover, even more so than usual, given that starting from the 14th century, the world passed through a period of colder winters in the Northern Hemisphere known as the Little Ice Age, Holy shit. with the 16th century having some of the record I mean, lows. Look at the recent... Peasants wore trousers and dresses made of wool to stay warm, but nobles wore higher quality garments made of velvet, embroidered jewelry, and felted furs. These latter were very exclusive, given that lots of tailors and tradesmen, even when wealthier, had to contend with laws restricting access to hunting grounds, and, in the most extreme cases, sumptuary laws prohibiting their purchase depending on a person's social standing. Then, when Columbus discovered oh, Europe literally hunted all of its animals for the Americas, That's insane. economic prospects moved I mean, to territorial but... ambitions among European kingdoms. The Spanish were the first to conquer their own lands, finding gold, silver, cities, and large populations that could be used as a workforce. The rest of Europe was not going to just sit back and let these riches fall into other hands undisputed, so they ventured in expeditions of their own. Nevertheless, it seemed like by the time the Iberians had already laid claim to the crown and its jewels, everyone else had ended up with a lesser deal. These frustrated ambitions are in part what motivated ceaseless... We saw in the crowd video that uh, at least England tried to replicate the Spanish model of trying to enslave the populations, but that didn't work with the more nomad populations of the north, so we'll see what happened in, in Quebec. And those fights are at the heart of why the language map of DC looks like a mosaic, whereas the rest of the continent is a lot more uniform. It was in the context Piracy. of these socio-economic dynamics that Jacques Cartier, a mariner from Saint-Malo, explored the waters of what he would name Jacques the Cartier. Gulf of St. Lawrence. He set off on various expeditions starting in 1534, looking for France's hot new route to Asia on the commission of King Francis I. Instead, he found a vast, cold continent full of woodland surrounding a long navigable river, which would also be later known as the St. Lawrence. He named this land Le Pays de Canata, after the Iroquoian oh. port for settlement, which he might have heard on his visits to Hochelaga and Stadacona. Cartier encountered Laurentians, oh. an Iroquoian-speaking people whose chief he kidnapped, and presented to the king with wild stories of a North American El Dorado as to motivate further exploration. Fishermen and traders then took to the emerging markets of North America. In medieval Europe, abstinence holidays such as Lent were more numerous, longer and stricter. That's why the coasts of the St. Lawrence Gulf and their abundant banks of cod were a great find for business. Years later, another explorer called Samuel de Champlain would use these fishermen's advice to explore once again. In the spring of 1608, Champlain rediscovered Stadacona, finding it abandoned and choosing it as the starting place for a settlement, L'Habitation, soon to become Quebec City. Oh, this village shit. and many others like it would start out as trading posts for the French to exchange Became goods with a the colony. natives. One spot that was especially important would be situated on a strategic island encrusted in the St. Lawrence River. This island would be the furthest of stream Cartier would ever go in his explorations, believing that the rapids his ships could not cross were the way to China. One that Champlain would name in a map of his making in 1632, the Island of the Royal Mount, or Montreal. Montreal. Wow. Having set themselves in these locations, France was in a position where it would need to start deciding how to approach the tribes near their spots, such as the Wendat, the Innu, and the Algonquins. In this situation, they opted for an agreeable and conciliatory approach. Though not without the British conflict, also did something the French similar. had generally positive and peaceful interactions with Native American Most tribes. Of. Surprising as this may sound considering the way that other European empires interacted with the Amerindians, the yeah, reality the, of New the France Spanish. was that traditional conquest was simply not an option. In Spain's colonies, the natives had been living under theocratic monarchies for thousands of years. There were dominant sociocultural norms, centers of power, and government. All things that the conquistadors could understand, subvert, and use to inform their rulership. Here there were complicated... A method that was used in Europe. You kill the king, 
take his lands, now you're the king of those lands. Dynastic politics, but that didn't work in North America. Different ideas about land ownership and no clear person or institution what to is overthrow for control. <laughs> At best, the newcomers could do little more yeah, than it is become just cool. another group of players in the game of tribal wars, although one with important advantages. Advantages they used for diplomacy. Come the late oh, 17th century, France could generate some of the best explorers of the North American interior because they were, by and large, guided by their native allies. However, these first friends would come with enemies, and in aligning themselves with them, France antagonized the most powerful group in the zone, the Five Nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Five Nations had been the most powerful actor in the Great Lakes. Smaller independent tribes resented that dominance, and when they encountered the French and their kind of like the Aztecs. they saw an opportunity to shift the balance of powers. Under indigenous request, Champlain led a mixed expedition in a confrontation against the Mohawk, setting France off to a rough start with the Confederacy. In a chaotic battle that took place after two of their parties bumped into each other, he would kill two chiefs with his firearm, Ooh. souring relations between both groups for a century. The rivalry that would thus emerge was in many ways existential for both sides. Trade with the First Nations was a lifeline of New France, one that the Haudenosaunee would constantly try Howdy. to have influence over, setting for the French less than favorable arrangements. The French, in turn, banned the sale of European weapons to the Confederacy, which put them at a severe security risk from all their better armed neighbors. Changing a military status quo, they had dominated, maybe, for centuries. With time, Champlain and Cartier's discoveries were the starting ground for a new French holding. The forests and shores of this region of the New World would fill up with more and more... It's alcohol. very interesting because the same thing happened in Mexico, for example. Here we have the Confederacy, a very big Confederacy. And then smaller tribes, smaller nations uh, felt a sort of resentment, right? So they used the arrival of the French as an excuse to sort of gain a little bit more power. The exact same thing happened in Mexico with the Aztec Empire dominating over smaller tribes. Outposts, it's interesting how the human French history would works. Find peoples who, when hostile, had little to race against gunpowder, and when cooperative, could trade them the many riches of the land. One yeah. of them being an animal. This was one of those animals oh, it's that gonna had be a been beaver? functionally extinct in Europe, and that in America would oh, also it's be, gonna be a beaver, at dude. that point. One whose pelt was of particularly high quality and could be refined into a comfortable and durable material that would be worn in hats even centuries later by the British upper classes, beaver. and one beaver. whose market would be a constant motive of war. The American beaver. In exchange for pelts, yes. the First Nations got everything from beavers are to awesome. knives to glass and lots of European items that they did not produce themselves. Novel trinkets that everyone wanted and that these strange visitors were willing to give out for their used clothes and a few furs. Suffice to say that with this introduction, the status quo went out the window. Native men might have become more socially important since now they had to play a bigger role in war and travel to control trade routes. Yeah. War over hunting grounds was no longer a matter of self-sustenance, but also of profit, which could have allowed the most successful beaver hunters to be more liberal with their gifts and thus more prestigious. Moreover, there were now new, more dangerous weapons entering the arena, <laughs> with supplies from the Dutch, who had just established a colony in modern-day New York, the Holy new Amsterdam at the time. These new weapons as well. Suddenly, they went to war with the Algonquian nations, who were then pushed further north towards the Inu, who themselves had been pushed east by the Mi'kmaq, and so on. This century-long series of guerrilla conflicts would come to be known as the Beaver Wars. Yeah, eight it was viewers. A string of brutal battles. Thank you guys. I hope you guys are enjoying the, the stream. North American fur trade. Seeing the warring tribes exterminating each other over game, it would see the Haudenosaunee, yeah, this is pretty good. This is supported pretty interesting. by the Dutch and later the English, fighting nearly every other North American group around them, who were usually supported by the French. New France would be involved in fights longer than it would be at peace, 
and over its existence it would become more and more militarized. In 1669, okay. the intendant got a mandate later, to guess. every able-bodied man up to the age of 60. Vue in now, Roman. Trade outposts would become increasingly policed and regulated. Then, the colonists would engage in the same retaliatory back and forth with British missions and Mohawk warriors, joining the century-old warfare traditions of this land. Still, Regardless of whatever profits the Mississippi and the Great Lakes bring to contemporary states, the French never succeeded in their attempts to create significant and settlement Michigan. in their North American territories. Right. By the way, he's including the new flag of Mississippi, so that's pretty cool. Before the Seven Years' War, the population of New France was somewhere around 70,000 inhabitants, whereas the 13 colonies had more than a million. Ooh, wow. How could this be? Well. Britain at the time had a quarter of France's population, and both countries had a peasantry that had incentives to take the transatlantic gamble. But French peasants had more to gain from staying put. Under English law, a property owner's descendants could be completely Nine written off viewers, from come on. left Woo. to fend on their own. Peasants also had very little control of the place they lived in, and everything to lose with eviction. France, on the other hand, had set up inheritances so, France was so a that little every nicer. son had a stake on the land, and lords did not have freehold tenures with which they could drastically dispossess their serfs. These civil That's codes why we were lost. known as the custom oh, of yeah, man. and they would be to a, a great lack extent of population, practiced yeah. in New France too. New France was also an unattractive destination in the public's imagination as a frozen wasteland populated by raiding savages and raging beasts. There existed more attractive alternatives for the people the who beasts. saw a change of pace. And as much as the kingdom could have tried to create a change in public perception, France feared large-scale displacements would represent a security risk for its homeland. Now, it's not <laughs> as if England did not share these concerns, but lots of its emigrants were religious dissidents who resented living under Anglicanism. Yeah. The English saw some merit in getting rid of them, whereas France, jaded by its own struggle... Yeah, that is true. Uh, you know, England had the Irish, the Scottish, a, a big prison population, because that's where they sent their prisoners to America, and then later to Australia when, it be when America became independent. So I guess France, you know, it didn't have a, an equivalent to the Irish or the Scottish. The Although they could have sent desired prisoners, to keep you know? its colonial possessions away from religious turmoil and schisms. Therefore, emigration to New France was strictly restricted to Catholics. You As a result, here. Canada expanded almost entirely through natural population growth. Wow. This is reflected in that all 6 million French Canadians today can trace back their ancestry to a pool of 10,000 common ancestors Whoa. from this time. New France has Whoa. a lot of other... Oh, 6 million to 10,000. That's very little. I guess that's how you could explain America's 300 million, 340 million, and Canada, I guess, has something like 35 million. Interesting like 10 percent like this one. Stretching from Louisiana to Labrador at its largest, the colony was not held together by a standing regular army, oh. but by putting itself at the center of the intricate web of diplomacy and commerce that had existed here for millennia. Though the legal and economic structures behind that feat are a subject of their own, the thing that transcended and that we will focus on is its society. Our Initially, France's France. <laughs> incentives to move people to Canada were designed for trade and not so much development. One could become a grandmaster by working a certain number of years in one of its towns. The kingdom would foot most of the bill, and upon completion, they were given the choice to either return to Europe or stay in the colony. Suffice to say, even among soldiers who were offered very lucrative deals, a vast majority took the sail back once their tenure... Yeah, that could have been an option, sending the Protestants to uh, New France. I mean, instead of like killing them or persecuting them. It was done. Many of the ones that did stay would have come by force or chance. Perhaps from this, it is easy to see why most of the early settlers of New France were men. They could generally mm. be classed as priests trying to expand Christianity or fortune seekers trying to profit from the markets of North America. Lots of these latter would become the coureurs de bois or forest runners, tradesmen who would go deep to the south and west 
and contacted Native Americans that were furthest inland. The coureurs Whoa. deepened the colony's ties to these tribes by marrying members of the First Nations, resulting in the creation of That's a always group happens. called Métis, the French word for mixed race. Given the severe gender imbalance in the colony, men would often get romantically involved with Native women, and their children would go to either side or start villages of their own that would blend French and indigenous Métis. cultures. Métis. Explorers and then the settlers themselves would adopt native customs such as dress and food they became to stay French. alive. When sealing alliances with Native Americans, some would even tattoo their bodies in the fashion of the warriors. This horrified the French elites who saw in this practice as a sort of reverse assimilation, but the governors of the colony would mostly let it be to keep the venture profitable, to some extent, for like, themselves. Like, okay, do it. As long now, as there's money. Now, it's important to say that France was not angelic. The French permitted slavery in the colony and, as a result, many of these interracial marriages were really settlers buying their wives. Oh, shit. Moreover, all this so celebrated exploration might have contributed in large part to old world epidemics expanding towards the West. That being said, even in the worst of readings, France was much milder than its contemporaries than the British, the Spanish, in this colony. the Portuguese. The head of this approach would be one of the great statesmen of the time, Cardinal Richelieu. By his debut, there were roughly a hundred permanent residents in New France, so he created a monopoly in charge of settlement and the fur trade. Richelieu also believed that the First Nations could be integrated into Frenchness proper, issuing an ordinance in oh. 1627 stating that those natives that converted to Catholicism would be French in the eyes of the crown. As such, they were priests cool. would take a very important role as community leaders. They would build and lead lots of institutions such as schools, hospitals, charities and parishes, orders such as the Ursulines and the Jesuits, took an active role in promoting Christianity to the First Nations and assimilating them as subjects. And though Richelieu expected that disintegration would help the colony's low population, in the end there were mixed results. Regardless, by 1666 his policies had increased New France headcount by thirdfold from Cartier's days, though the gender imbalance remained. Then there would come a second <laughs> from Cartier's a days, sausage party. The gen yeah. <laughs> gender imbalance remained. That's pretty funny. Then there would come a second performer. Louis the 14th. Ooh. Louis, the icon of absolutism that he was, would take control of Canada from Richelieu's company, making it a royal province and managing it as his personal land. Ooh, that's he would not deploy good. a regular army to protect it and end the beaver wars, institutionalize licenses for the coureur de voie, and among many, many, many other things, the many. Sun King would fix the gender imbalance by recruiting women to send to Canada. They would come to be known as Le Fils de Roi, or the King's Daughters, from whom many... Yeah, I remember from my French classes that Phil is daughter, or Phil, I don't know how you pronounce it. Interesting people today are descended. In New France, land was managed in a curious semi-feudal form of organization called the seigneurial system. Since all territories in New France belonged to the king who was very far away, landlords were appointed from among the nobility to oversee agricultural development in his name. They installed themselves at large fiefs along the St. Lawrence River. To attract settlers, the peasantry of these fiefs would be offered a great deal of rights on the land. These worked as incentives that made sense for the purpose of kickstarting the country, but we now know these failed. No never got large, profitable holds as the mainlanders, while peasants ultimately found lots of benefits. Though New France had the rigid classes of any other European society of the time, its legal makeup allowed for a community yeah. with higher living standards overall. The settlers themselves, having come from a wide range of places in the mainland, created a unique, standardized French culture. A new cuisine and dialect were born in a community that borrowed the characteristics the team, from each other syrup. and First Nations. Around the early 18th century, the average inhabitant of New France was more literate, more urban, and in many ways more the independent French than their European counterparts. Oh, and the average Canadian 
This is very interesting. This happened in America, the USA. This also happened in Mexico. New Spain was wealthier than Spain itself. As they came to be known, so, lived as well as the top 10% of mainland France. This was a unique community. One where intercultural relations were key to it functioning. This is probably well symbolized in that by the end of the Bieber Wars, a governor general of New France, a man in his 70s from the suburbs of Paris, picked up a tomahawk and led a war dance to rally his native allies in a series of raids oh. against the Haudenosaunee. He then delivered a string of severe defeats to the heart of their land using native warfare. A decade later, That's pretty cool. France effectively That's pressured them into peace in a ceremony where French dignitaries and native chiefs held a banquet while passing around a peace pipe. Having settled this, peace New France always was a second fiddle in the French Empire. The fact that the fur trade was less profitable than other colonial ventures would mean that the colony was more an influence that never got too much attention from the crown. Lime. That apathy from above led to a status quo between natives and settlers unique to that age. We cool, and if you're yeah, honest, we cool. especially unique in French colonialism. This society was a lot of things. It was clearly influenced by a French, Catholic and monarchist base, but it also was far away from this powers. Yeah, based. Totally there were based. times when settlers could choose to stick to traditions and without a rigid overwatch of state authorities, they decided not to. Nobles engaged in commerce, which they were forbidden to do in the mainland. Women had better property rights, and they even brandished home-owned muskets to defend their homes from native raids. Understanding just how relaxed this society was in its customs, especially for the time, makes it even more interesting when knowing it would become one of the most conservative and reactionary places in the Americas. Oh. That's we not very are nice. somewhat deep into this video, so I hope that you have found something interesting. I could tell, however, that if you were a French elite from the 1700s, oh, it's not over, right? you would not no. be impressed at all. By the dawn of the 18th century, the supply of fur to Europe was four times the demand, which made ventures to New France less enticing. The colony had lost a lot of attention, and as we have explored, France might have been relatively respectful to its native allies because their interests in the region were ambivalent. We need to remember this was the same empire that was ruling Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. The truth is that the French king's true warring ambitions always lay on Europe, while the upper classes did not care and even resented possession of the colony, in contrast with France's more temperate more profitable Caribbean and African islands. Voltaire, for example, was particularly dismissive of New France, wishing, for example, that the Lisbon earthquake had instead oh, happened. Oh shit, a few acres of snow. Goddamn, Voltaire. And there, he wrote numerous letters throughout his life. Hard. Oh, Quebec has a racism issue they have to work on. Ooh. So I guess that that's why he mentioned that it's a very conservative place. And I honestly cynical, didn't but he knew. already lacks attention that the colony received, and even had the disses in some of his books. The English already found themselves in possession of the best and the most advantageously positioned lands in septentrional North America, other than Florida, when two or three Norman merchants, with the faint hope of putting up a small pelting business, equipped some vessels, and established a colony in Canada, a country covered in snow and ice eight months of the year, populated by barbarians, bears, and beavers. Holy shit. This land, discovered around the year 1535, was abandoned, but in the end, after many attempts, ill-supported by a government that did not have a navy, a small company of merchants from Dieppe and saint malo founded Quebec in 1608. That is to say, they built a few cabins, and these cabins didn't become a city until Louis XIV came around. This establishment, that of Louisbourg, and all the others in this new France, have always been very poor. While there are 15,000 carriages in Mexico City, and more in Lima, these bad countries are nonetheless an almost continual subject of war, either with the natives or with the English, who, possessors of the better territories, wanted to take away that of the French to be the sole masters of the commerce of this boreal part of the world.
part two. La con... I don't know how to pronounce that. The conquest? I know my French, yo. Getting a picture of the wars of the 18th century is a long Ooh. and complex task that's way beyond Especially the scope of this Especially for France. Year. But the geopolitical broad strokes we need to keep in oh, mind are man. that Europe was a warring continent with borders changing every 20 odd years. Yeah. After a war, the powers would gather, agree on a new the status pieces. quo, and use peacetime to rearm only to find something to fight over, again and again and again. The balance of powers was delicate, and it was in everyone's interest that Every, everything became about the balance of power. The royal family did not get powerful enough to steamroll all the rest, yet it was no secret that everyone wanted to do exactly that. This bucket of craps had been that way since medieval Russia, times, Austria, but with colonial and resources Russia. and territories at hand, oh, the, the Holy scale Roman of these Empire. conflicts got increasingly global. In these battles, France and Britain would often be on opposing sides. To add context to Voltaire's cynicism, it is true that once the fur trade started to die down, one of the main, if not the main reason why France held on to Canada was because it contained British power in North America. Britain was very much aware of this, and the territories would spend a significant amount of time pointing daggers at each other's throats. In this they setup, needed a Britain spark. had obvious advantages. The 13 colonies had a much larger population, a more developed economy and infrastructure, and the support of the British Navy. New the France, Royal on the Navy. other hand, was aided by its many native allies, experience in the frontier, and in the worst case scenario, it could dispose of a better army, while also having comfort in that were New York to be attacked, South Carolina would not exactly rush to yeah. its support. North American theaters would be fought in captured oh. forts and surprise attacks. French stations in North America would generally be able to hold their own, delivering significant defeats to the British. Still, when the dust settled at the negotiation table, the French king would prioritize his continental ambitions, appeasing Britain by giving it big chunks of Canadian territory for whatever end he considered at the time. In the War of the Spanish Succession, for example, Louis XIV had put his grandson on the throne of Spain, a decision that everyone resented. So Europe descended into a long and inconclusive war where various heirs died after 13 years of fighting an entirely new situation Grinch. to threaten everyone's ambitions. So the powers that be <laughs> stopped. In the ensuing peace treaty, France succeeded in crowning its claimant, but it wrote off Newfoundland, the Hudson Bay, and Acadia to settle the deal with the British. The two former were largely empty and strategic territories, whereas Acadia was a peninsula they inhabited were giving up by Canada. some 10,000 French colonists. When Britain had come in possession of their land, the colonists were offered to remain in peace if they swore an oath of allegiance to the English monarch, who was Anglican, so they refused. Throughout the years to come, they would continue to have close ties with New France and its people. When Merda. Britain tried to increase Protestant settlement in Nova Scotia, the Acadians started a guerrilla war with their Mi'kmaq allies that would frustrate this effort. And with this precedent, Britain would increasingly consider them a security risk, especially with their closeness to one of France's greatest <laughs> strongholds in North America, the fortress of Louisbourg. For the rest of New France, British encroachment would also become an issue. Louisbourg. The first half of the 18th century saw the colony Where at its that? most established and regulated, but it would also be its relatively weakest point. By far, the greatest war in our story will be the Seven Years' War, Ooh. or as Americans say, for reasons that should be clear by now, the French and Indian War. Oh, shit. The Seven shoot. Years' War would be called the Great War. This could be the Seven Years' War could actually be considered the first world war since it is it was a fought in multiple continents. The Americas uh, now we're, they're showing us how Austria and he I think he has a flag of the Holy Roman Empire, but no, it's it's Austria. Yeah, Austria and Prussia and would go to war in the same way that the war that we call the Great War began. Oh, shit, a web yeah. of alliances compelled many powers to combat, triggered by a spark of aggression. The British deported the Acadian. One side, Damn, that really there sucks. was the Austrian Empire, Russia, and France. 
And on the other, Prussia, we have Prussia and Britain. The UK, yeah. Though the conflict began over a corner of the Holy Roman Empire, the larger struggle around it oh, would it's... be one of global dominance between I think the I know British the game, and the French name, but... empires. This was truly a World War Zero of sorts. Aside the European theater, the two Red largest the powers would fight each other in Africa, India, and North America. Now, oh, if the in India too. scales between the kingdoms seem drastic to you, the armies will appear monstrous. Still, an army alone does not win a war, and William Pitt, the then leader of the House of Commons, understood this. Pitt did not want to burn off the British army in a senseless battle he had little chance of winning. Instead, the strategy he would opt for, besides planting an army in Hanover to hold the Prussian western flank, would be providing resources to Frederick the Great's continental army and using the Royal Navy to harass France's colonial... By the way, Prussia had a really good army, a great army that they have been built for over a century by then. And also in Seven Years' War, Russia became sort of friendly with Prussia because I, I, the leader of Russia, I don't remember the name, just felt really good about Prussia. So I was like, hey, uh, you know what? I'm not going to bully you anymore. And that's how Prussia won, became powerful, united Germany under Prussian power, you know? Britain is very island, important, and it has always been in its interest to protect itself from the sea. France, on the other hand, yeah, the Royal has Navy many is continental rivals. It has two coastlines, and at different times in history, its leaders would prefer to fund either its ground troops or its fleets. This was particularly... And we saw a little bit of, uh, on the Napoleon uh, video, how uh, the United Kingdom was like the mistress of the sea, but France and its army were the master of the continent. So it's a kind of, I win you in the ocean, but you win me on land. And it's kind of land versus water. And I guess this is how it started. need maintenance and infrastructure, which cannot exactly be... Oh, okay. Here's something interesting. The Acadians became the Cajuns, Cajuns in Louisiana. Built overnight. Though the French captured British Majorca at the beginning of the war, they would proceed to have their ports blockaded by the British and their ships wrecked in two major battles. The result was that Britain consolidated itself as the indisputable naval power of Europe, and it used its supremacy to wreak havoc in France's colonial possessions. As such, the defense of Canada was only its initial relief. 7,000 regulars aided by 8,000 militiamen under Louis-Joseph de Montcalm, whereas Britain deployed 20,000 regulars oh, aided by 22,000 militiamen under James Wolfe and Geoffrey Amherst. Even then, despite the big difference in numbers, the North American theater had new France with the upper hand in the beginning of the war. Oh. Starting in 1753, the French and their native allies terrorized the 13 colonies, successfully capturing and defending forts and defeating a young George Washington. Twice. Oh. This was, however, not the end for the British cause. George Washington. Whereas France would continue to put North America in a second plane of attention, Britain would commit itself fully to victory in this theater, and part of that involved dealing with every security risk that could get in the way of taking over Canada. I love how they call them security The Great of Evil is the name that Acadians give to the decision of Governor Charles Lawrence of Nova Scotia to forcibly remove them from the region. 11,500 people were expelled on little criteria, Ooh. about 80% of the colony's population. Most were civilians who died by the thousands due to disease or shipwrecks. The economy of the region would essentially collapse and hundreds of families would be separated. The Acadians would be relocated to the 13 colonies and later to France and Britain. Today the diaspora is spread out throughout North America and Europe with the vast majority living in Louisiana, where they have become the Cajun people. This the was Cajun a measure people. of population okay. displacement that the British crown would acknowledge for the suffering it caused, apologizing for it in a royal proclamation oh, wow. in 2003. As for France, the it would Queen not apologize. make that's, to protect that's, the That's a big deal. Around 1758, Britain would start to come on top. Montcalm was brash and insensitive towards France's Native American allies, stressing a relationship that had been based on respect at the worst possible time, since they were dealing with smallpox at more lethal rates and an antagonizing ally, they circumvented the general and made peace with Britain on their own terms. Later, 
Louisbourg and many forts would fall, which would clear the road to the St. Lawrence. Wolfe would then head a 40,000 men expedition towards Quebec in March of 1750, leading a army. punitive campaign against the towns and farms of the countryside. Despite this and other pressures, Montcalm did not leave his position on the opposite side of the river. As winter approached, Wolfe was finding himself in a bit of an invading Russia situation, so he gambled elite troops and hmm. artillery invading up a Russia. where they took a position in the fields of Abraham. Montcalm would rush to repel this offensive when he noticed it, staffing himself mostly with militiamen rather than regulars, and though they would fire the first bullets, the British would have a more effective response volley that would win them the day. Among the fatally injured though, both generals would be hit, Wolf Ooh. died almost immediately, and Montcalm would fall the next day from his injuries. The remainder of the French army that had no role in the battle would leave the city towards the west, and Britain took over Quebec City, which they held during the winter. These soldiers would lead a counterattack under Montcalm's second in command eight months later, and though they would win, their victory would not be enough to dislodge the British army in Quebec. Then, as the river thawed, it would. The Cajun people are known to make very good food in Louisiana. I've heard that Louisiana has actually some pretty good food. It would be the Royal Navy who arrived to reinforce their position. I think I need now to go to Louisiana. Now with the British Louisiana. projecting power everywhere around the river, the governor capitulated to Amherst. New France had fallen. <sighs> the fall of New France, my friends. With it's so sad, I, I feel... Over. Britain would agree to give amnesty to the defeated Canadians. It also agreed to keep their society relatively intact, with Acadia being the big exception relatively. they did not cede any ground on. Three years after this, the kingdoms of Europe were at the bottom of their pockets, with France drained because of the blockade, Austria unable to retake Silesia, and Russia having nothing short of a serious identity crisis. Louis XV sued for peace. In the ensuing treaty, Britain would give France the option to choose between keeping either its North American possessions or the plantation colonies of Guadeloupe. France chose the island. Caribbean. It argued a case for keeping Saint-Pierre et Miquelon off the coast of Newfoundland with fishing rights, and that would be the end of French rule in continental North America. With this began an era of British domination. Now, is that true? Didn't Napoleon recover the Louisiana territory for like a couple of years? In the region, and with its gains throughout the world, the United Kingdom would confirm its status as the undisputed global power under the recently crowned George III. He would enact the proclamation of 1763, establishing that New Britannica France would become would a British colony, the province of Quebec. This proclamation aimed for the assimilation of the conquered French colonists. Governors could only be appointed by the British Parliament. The French were to be integrated into English colonial customs, and Catholics were barred from positions of power unless they were an oath of allegiance to the British monarch. Much like the Acadians, they refused to do it as well. And here's where the story in some ways truly begins. Britain's way of dealing with their new French subjects would be the beginning of a national sentiment born from social alienation. In many ways, Britain was magnanimous. Under the capitulation of Montréal, <laughs> it allowed the colonists to leave for France, and if they decided to stay, they would keep their properties. Still, it was clear that British governance would come with British people and British priorities, something that was threatening to their way of life in the long run. They thought of themselves as a distinct, conquered people that did not see any reason to be loyal to a Protestant king. Their main point of interest was to live as they had, to the extent that they could manage, for as long as possible. On the other hand, the Native Americans who had so far kept a degree of independence by Ooh, playing either now they to would the French side ruled. or the British side, would now have to deal exclusively with a single, all-encompassing government. Given the hostilities and incursions they were facing by vengeful colonists, they rose against Britain during an uprising known as Pontiac's Rebellion. In response to all this discontent, King George III would revise his approach to North America, putting forward the Quebec Act of 1774. In this document, 
he reinstated the French colonists, now Quebecois or Quebecers, right to keep the custom of Paris. Catholicism would no longer be an obstacle to participate in government, okay. even if it remained That's so nice. in Britain, and the seniorial system would stay would be mostly cool. intact. Additionally, an indigenous reservation west of the Appalachian Mountains would be created to protect the natives from incursions. All these measures were One done to America would would not people. respect. And though they achieved that to arguable degrees, what they did succeed at was in making the 13 colonies red Angry. with fury. It would be in this moment that George's great American empire would collapse. But that is a story for later. With the last major character about to enter the scene, what we have America. assembled here is the framework on which British rule over Canada was built. Now that we know where we're coming from, what we'll see when we come back is the birth of the modern Canadian state, and more importantly to this story, the Anglo-French relationship itself. Now, there are many things one can conclude from looking at this chapter of history, but if there's one lesson to be learned, it's perhaps a very simple one. Neglect has its consequences. We can say this is true of Montcalm at a critical moment, but overall it is true of France itself. If the French North American state disappeared off the map, it's because it didn't receive the resources and investment yeah. it needed in an age I mean, of France pretty much ignored, well, not ignored 100%, but decided to neglect uh, New France or, or like Quebec. And as a result, they lost it. They rather kept that small... Is Guadalupe an island? I think Guadalupe is an island, right? They decided to keep that very small island. Of empires. And Quebec. That being said, had France been more interested in building a society here, it most likely wouldn't have turned out the way it did. The catch is, though, that even if this French state disappeared, the French people in it didn't. Yeah. They would embark in a 19th century that was a fascinating journey of political intrigue and cultural struggles. One that's surprising to tell from looking at the modern state we all know. Well, tighten your snowshoes because taking that journey is exactly what we're doing. Next time. To be continued. Jesus Christ. I learned a lot. Is there like part two out there? I mean, it should be, right? Uh, no. There is no part two. There's like a preview, but there is no part two. Well, that really sucks. Wait, is this for real? Like, oh, Guadalupe still French. Well, I guess then maybe it was worth it, I guess. But yeah, it, it's cool. The video was amazing. It was really good. I, I personally enjoyed it maybe more than the Mexican or the Turkish because I knew a lot about its history, but Canada being sort of a neighbor to the north. And sorry, this is not about Canada. This is about Quebec, the people of Quebec. It's always really nice because I do imagine that maybe the people of Quebec sometimes feel a little bit ignored. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I guess they're Anglo countrymen have sometimes the most attention but it was really nice yeah let, let's watch the preview i'm sad that there's no part two i hope that he's still working on it but let's watch the preview guys part two a discourse of nations on nations Quebec does not have opinions, but only sentiments. Wilfrid Laurier, 7th Prime Minister of Canada. When Britain conquered its North American Empire, it had to find solutions to lots of problems. First, it was now the government presiding over an area big enough to tap the northern Baltic in the north and the shores of Alexandria in the south, and span the distance from the Aral Sea to Edinburgh. This, while considering all the cultural and political complexities empire. of the societies within these lands, as well as continuing to manage European politics and the rising empire. 
From their perspective at the time, the group that threatened North American stability the most were the Canadiens. As opposed to the 13 colonies, the province of Quebec was inhabited by a foreign people that might have at any moment rebelled. In many ways, they were doing that already, something that Britain sought to stop. If Britain made all the concessions it made in the Quebec Act, it was largely because delivering constant responses to Quebec's many problems was becoming a burden on their ability to manage said territory. However, Britain also had another thing in mind, containing the power of their semi-autonomous colonies further in the south. <laughs> the 13 colonies saw the defeat of New France as a tremendous opportunity. Now, they could finally expand their religion, their markets and their lands to a new frontier, but they were stopped on their tracks by Parliament, who instead levied them with taxes to pay for the costs of the war that they had just fought. In these circumstances, Americans seeking their independence was maybe inevitable. In removing the French threat from the 13 colonies, maybe was. the case for local management and self-rule was probably increasingly was. evident. Britain made the argument for its military presence and its presence overall obsolete. Still, the American colonists remained British subjects, and as King George's subjects, he expected them to comply with his plans. America often no, romanticizes no, no. George as some exceptional tyrant in their national myths. But many of the choices of his government were really compromises to face challenges at home and to keep this behemoth of a continent together. Britain's key concern was that had the empire not tried to close up its ties to America, these colonies might have just become an entity too powerful to reign and too independent to rule, as they eventually did. Britain lost its war against the Americans, which left it humiliated, weakened, and deeply in debt. The French king helped the Americans in this revolution as a part of those European politics of hostility we have discussed before. Yeah. It could have been in his demands to and the Dutch the and Republic the Sp Spanish. to reclaim the lost territories, yet France did no such thing. One can almost imagine how the nobility sighed in relief now that managing Canada was the Brits' problem. <laughs> and the Brits' problem it was. The UK inherited the exact uncomfortable geopolitical position that New France had had to deal with, with the added complication that they were a colonial empire fighting against home advantage. If it had been a British interest for the French Canadians not to rebel, now it was triply so, lest they lose even more of their hold of North America. But the Bourbons would not get the last laugh, because this aid to the Americans was also expensive for them which led to yet another revolution. And this one, the French Revolution. <laughs> Bastille topping, head chopping, king popping. It was crazy. The French Revolution appended every social da, structure of monarchy to it. Da, 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 In its earliest da, stages, it was da, actively da, da, subverting all facets of the medieval da, social da, hierarchies da, that had been the norm da, for centuries. Da, da, the French, who were once one of the bastions of Catholicism along with the Austrians and the Spanish, were now tearing down crucifixes to raise altars Marat. to the goddess of reason. The reaction of the Vatican was one of utter panic as its priests became the victims of expulsions and persecution by the Directory. There was a real fear that the liberal ideas of the age would scorch through the nations of Christendom, which could mean a widespread weakening of the Church's political power, yet another fear that was accurately placed, as this too eventually happened. To control British North America, a compliant Catholic Church negotiated a downscale of its position and economic power to guarantee the survival of the religion. And the effects this had in French Canadian <laughs> I society... do know some of the lyrics. I just really enjoy La Marseillaise as an, a national anthem. And I do know some of the lyrics. Not perfectly, but almost there. Drastic. Because now, without their usual institutions, such as the state or the army, the Catholic but it's Church a really became cool anthem. the Very one single established entity through which the Canadiens could organize as a group. This resulted in a curious quid pro quo between the King of England and the Holy See. Britain would not let another uprising in North America come about if they could do something about it, with Quebec being a prime point of attention for this. And the Vatican did not want the one remaining semblance of French medieval society to be lost to some new world flavor of Jacobinism. Some revolutionaries. However, Britain's concerns were quickly settled. Many French Canadians disapproved of the revolution as some of those expelled oh. priests made their way to the shores of the St. Lawrence, 
with horror stories of the decapitated king. More significant... Okay, that could tell us a little bit about modern Quebec, a sort of more conservative state that disapproved of the French Revolution. Three, though, not every person in New England wanted to take part in the American project. So there was a massive immigration out of the nascent United States by loyalists who throughout the independence process had had their families harassed and their properties assaulted. Many went back to England in a campaign of resettlement, but another target location for them were the northern edges of the eastern Great Lakes, in the nearest lands of what the French called Les Pays d'Onon, or the upper country, and that today we call hmm. the province of Ontario. Over a few years, oh. the population of Nova Scotia tripled with the influx of refugees. And those newcomers were not even the core of it, as the southern St. Lawrence lowlands would receive many, many more. The written commentary of the government officials who managed this are essentially long laments on the logistical nightmare that it was. Among these people were American northerners, southerners, black slaves, some of which were promised freedom if they made it to the territory, and indigenous wow. peoples fleeing from American expansionism, mainly Iroquoians. It is estimated that around 90,000 people moved. That's the a plus lot. for Britain, though, was that these lands that were inhabited by the potentially rebellious French were swarmed by fervent pro-British settlers. <laughs> by royalists, People who saw this yeah. American project as an unruly experiment headed for disaster, one that was not worth Anarchist. the trouble of sacrificing the political structures they knew and wanted to hold on to. This impression, that of Canadian common sense, in contrast with American rashness and recklessness, arguably continues to this day in the country's self-perception. <laughs> America. No! Well, first of all, that was a really good video, but uh, I really hope he, uh, you know, he didn't uh, left the project. I hope that he finishes, finishes it because it, it was really good. There's not a lot of good material on the story about French Canadians and Quebec. And I'm glad that he did it, you know? They deserve a video. And it was really good, guys. Uh, thank you so much for recommending it. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, amazing video. But, uh... You know, for the if you any if any of you is watching from Europe, I imagine already it's very late. Uh, right now, I just come from the movie theater from watching Spider Man, so I still have to process all the all the movie, which was pretty good movie. If you haven't watched Spider Man, go watch it. It's it's amazing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it to you, uh, but you have to watch it. It's pretty cool, and I'll definitely pay attention when part when part three two comes out. You bet I'm going to do like a reaction instantly, okay? And we're going to do a stream together or you can see the video if, if you can catch the stream, right? But uh, no, thank you so much for reaction, for, uh, not for reacting, for uh, staying with me. Special, special thanks to uh, Fritos. Uh, I, I hope that I'm pronouncing this correctly. Fritos and Yush Clay. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but thank you guys for staying the entire stream. And I really appreciate uh, the recommendation. It was pretty good. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much.